Good evening. Namaskar. It's absolutely fantastic to be here. I have in front of me my professor, Professor S.N. Uh, I did two courses with him. And one I got an A and the other I got almost an F. <laughs> and uh, that's because he didn't allow a copy. So today I'm going to take revenge. <laughs> I have got my speech in a small note here, which I'm going to Thanks, Professor. <laughs> you know, 35 years back, as a young lad, I set foot in the city of Varanasi and walked into the hallowed portals of this great institution. And I think just like the river Varanas and the river Ganga takes a turn to point back at its source. Only in Varanasi and nowhere else, for me it is like coming back to my roots. So another first TED talk out here is much more than an honor or a pleasure for me. It's a whole lot of more emotions than that. Many of us believe that Varanasi anyway is the center of the universe. So just as well that the first TED talk should be on Pangeanics or Pangeanism. Come on, I, mean, I think the Banaras Hindu University is in the shape of a sun, right? So we not only believe that we are the center of the earth, we believe that we are the center of the whole planetary system. So that's as well that we have taken this subject. I'm not going to take 18 minutes. You know, even back then, the end semester exam used to be for two and a half hours. But I used to finish in one and a half, but I knew only one and a half of chemical engineering. <laughs> You know, the topic Pangeanism itself is not new. In 1516, Thomas More coined the concept called Utopia. And a lot of what was talked about in utopian terms is not very different from the Pangeanism that we today talk about. But what we do know is that in the 600 years that this subject has been discussed and debated, the world has only degenerated that much more. So, I am not really in favor of any ism. In fact, I believe that every ism leads to a schism. Every philosophy creates a new rupture in humanity. And the reason why it is, isn't start with a certain philosophy, a certain positive emotion. But very soon, you will end up with people who are completely committed to it, who get conditioned by it, and uh, subsequently in the process are not in a position to listen to any alternate view on that subject. With the result that sooner or later, every ism which started as a good, ideal, positive move, immediately deteriorates into a system. So I'm not in favor of isms. Let me give you some examples. If you have a child and you teach your child honesty. And then at home, the mobile phone rings. The father knows that it's the boss calling and tells the child to pick up the phone and say, tell boss dad is not at home. Right? So in that one instant, honesty moves from being absolutism to relativism. Like that, there are many isms. So you have capitalism, which is in conflict with communism. And if you know, one political philosopher said, capitalism is man exploiting man, communism is the other way. 
and then you have socialism. You also have feudalism, uh, not just racist, uh, but much more than that, even in our country. So if a, a, a junior person, typically a worker, has to enter a senior's room, he would leave his footwear outside before entering the room, and that's her. And that comes back from feudalism. Of course, nowadays it is with the political atmosphere, it is good not to have anyone enter with their footwear into your office. But that's a that's a different subject. There are such conflicts across other other areas also. So, for example, there's a huge debate now on feminism versus masculinism. And you had uh, Barack Obama, you know, uh, talking about, uh, you know, saying that uh, Miss uh, Kamala Harris was extremely attractive, and the most attractive attorney general, and got a lot of flag. So there he lost his spontaneism and has now got to compensate it with political correctism. <laughs> and there are other such systems. Um, gender, race. And you see the matrimonial act today, I'm sure some of you are going to start seeing it very soon. Um, <laughs> they still have girl attractive fair. Right? 9 out of 10 advertisements say that the girl is fair. If 9 out of 10 people in this country were fair, there was no need to say it in the first place. <laughs> but we built so many myths. And each one of these isms create a conflict. Each one of the isms also leads to a counterism. Uh, take for example uh, something like uh, casteism. Now, in the pre-independence time, there was a party called the Justice Party, and the Justice Party was a group of non-Brahmin communities that came together to oppose a Brahmin domination in the bureaucracy, education and judiciary in the pre-independence time. It started as a strong, good movement. But it soon deteriorated because within what was a cohort called non-Brahmin community, a schism appeared between the caste Hindus and the Dalits and the Muslims. So whenever people come together with an ideology, a counter ideology immediately um, sets it, which breaks down the first ideology. If you want to take the corporate world as an example, we saw a couple of musicians, theatre people, film people presenting earlier, one of the biggest motivation of an artist, in fact the biggest motivation of an artist is to perform and is to perform to a large audience and to have the audience enjoy it all over the world. But businesses have created a structure of IPR, copyright, patent to ensure that democratization of performance does not happen. So every is leads to a counterism, and not only is there an upbringing context and a geographical context or an emotive context, sometimes it could also have a time or a temporal context. Like India was one country, but when the British withdrew, they drew a line, and overnight there was a strong sense of nationalism in India and Pakistan which did not exist one day before that. And today, you know, we argue, we fight, we passionately um, you know, fight with each other on whether Pakistani cricketers should participate in India IPL. But the fact is, nationalism in that context happened only 60 years back. So fundamentally, every user leads to some kind of a system. And that is because the moment you subscribe to a philosophy, 
you start isolating other philosophies. The moment you isolate other philosophies, you immediately now become secluded, become intolerant, and become negative. And that creates a whole host of problems. Then we talk about some of the negative thoughts that humankind have always lived with. So there's abandonment, there's aggression, there's suffering, there is greed, there is uh, struggle. There are all kinds of negative emotions that people live with. And that's a whole lot of problems, right? But when you think of it, there aren't that many problems because they're all intelligent. For example, let's take greed, which is a fairly significant motivator in the corporate world. You're greedy for a promotion. And because you're greedy for a promotion, you would hold back on some information. You would get very aggressive with some of your competitors, sometimes in an ugly way. You would start favoring people who are aligned with you. You would start rejecting people who are against you. In the process, you would create factionalism in the organization and more fear. And this would go on and on. Right? So, you would take any one of those negative emotions and you would find that all the emotions are built around any one emotion. So, what, what, what that means is every ism eventually starts elaborating, exemplifying, highlighting a certain isolation and a certain negativism. And when you can't accept this thing, you become intolerant. And tolerance is now a big subject. Wherever you go in the world, people talk about tolerance. In fact, the United Nations talks about having an international day for tolerance. So you have the Muslims killing the Jews, the Jews killing the Christians, the Christians killing back the Muslims, who are killing the Hindus, who are killing the Muslims, and it's a vicious cycle that's going on. And this is uh, not the preserve only of religion. Uh, you had the whole Cold War for 30 years, which was essentially a, a, a fight between capitalism and socialism stroke communism. So, when so much intolerance comes into play, immediately we start building up the virtues of tolerance. But is tolerance really a virtue? What does tolerance mean? Tolerance means to put up with the wrong. To, it is not an acceptance of an alternate view. Tolerance means to put up with the wrong. Now who's to decide what is right and what is wrong? Nobody knows that. So there isn't a master to decide. So in effect, tolerance becomes a test of endurance. It is not a test of acceptance. Right? And when you do that, you would still feel hatred towards a person. You may not express it. It will be like latent, latent in your system. But when many people in the society converge on that latent hatred, it eventually helps. And when that eruption happens and violence happens, we once again go back to talking about how the society should be tolerant. Fortunately, I think the world doesn't have to uh, be like that. Uh, for example, Gandhi said that let the winds blow from all corners into my house, but I will not get swayed by any. So what we need today is openness an openness to receive messages. And it's only with openness would you have dialogue, would you have debate, would you have reconciliation. 
and you need that. I mean, after all, think about it. Uh, what is the physical distance between Rajputana hostel and the girls hostel? It's about 100 meters. But what's the psychological distance? <laughs> technology, no amount of internet and mobile phone, etc. is going to help you on that. There has to be an openness of mind. Only then can there be a connection. <laughs> now it's easy to say openness. Why? Why is man not being open today? We are open today because of our insecurities. And that primary insecurity is a fear, and I believe it's a fear of death, which I think is a very appropriate discussion once again in the city of Varanasi, because this is a city that celebrates life and celebrates death. Right. If only, what, 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 we, what humankind does is we start acquiring. We acquire fame, we acquire fortune, uh, and we acquire a whole lot of peripheral unnecessary elements around us as a compensation for the mortality that we fear. Imagine how horrible this world would be if people did die. How much more acquisitive you would be. So if only we could live every day knowing that today may be the last day, what is it that you would do? Would you compete? Would you be looking for the extra market share? Would you be trying to solve some random problem? What would be the emotions that you would go through? What is the value that you would create in society? Fundamentally, if you realize that you were mortal and you are here for, for a day, every day, I think there will be a lot of openness. And with that openness, you will find a lot of joy and really the concept of Pangeanism. And I think you have examples here. You have an Ustad Bismillah Khan from Banaras, who is not, not a citizen of India, who was a citizen of the universe. Close of home, the founder of this university, lived most of his life in Varanasi, but he created a world university. Last week, you had one of your professors passed away, who was in the civil engineering department, who spent all his life in Varanasi, at the Sandhuk Mochan Mandir, but he was also the time man of the year. So you don't have to see very far for examples. You can sit here, you are the center of the universe. You are not just the center of this country. And Pangeanism is not what you see. Outside, Pangeanism is really what you see within you.